Our consciousness is a process that is regulated by our body's own biological clock, or circadian rhythms. The phrase circadian rhythm, it's really a combination of two words, circa, dian, uh, and circa, it's Latin for about, and dian, a day. So what we're talking about with circadian rhythms are these, these psychological, these biological factors, uh, processes that, that oscillate over the course of about a day. The circadian clock is a concept that has been studied for many years. And in lower animals, such as insects, there is not a specific location for the circadian clock. But by the time you get up to mammals, the circadian clock is located in the hypothalamus, in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And in this particular area, it controls a, the 24-hour rhythm of the animal, controlling all physiological processes, as well as the major process, which is the sleep-wake cycle. Our normal sleep-wake cycles and other processes, such as body temperature, hearing, taste, and smell, are also regulated by external influences. The issue for researchers with circadian rhythms was, you know, what, what keep, keeps us operating on this 24-hour this cycle? And what you have is this very potent environmental stimulus, sunlight. What the sunlight does is it sets our circadian rhythms to operate and stay on that 24-hour cycle. There are many cues that can affect the circadian rhythm, and that can be a social cues in terms of like when you're around other people. Eating can be a cue for the biological clock when you eat meals. Exercise sometimes can affect your, your circadian rhythm, but the major effect really comes from light. The sun cycle, or the light level, is probably the most important timing mechanisms for these circadian rhythms. And within that, probably the time of dawn, the time of sunset, and the length of the period of light or the length of the period of darkness are the most important uh, timing cues for our brain. But what happens when your occupation makes it necessary to break the 24-hour cycle? For Ray Casillas, making the adjustment is a major factor in the performance of his job. In a 24-hour period, we're always on, in some way, constant alert, you know, and, you, and you're always just a little bit conscious. You're aware of your surroundings, whether you're in bed or you're trying to take a nap or you're coming back from a call after hours, you know, and you're sitting in the back of the fire engine. You're still, that your mind is still, you, half of you is awake and the other half of you is trying to to downshift some gears. Uh, shift workers who, again, work at night on call are an interesting group because they may not be called at night. The interesting thing is that if the worker knows he or she might be called, their sleep remains light. They do not get into the deeper stages of sleep, simply knowing this might happen. Our circadian rhythms are not only responsible for when you go to sleep and when you wake up, but also for how well you perform during the day. This is because circadian rhythms also regulate your mental alertness. Most of us are more alert in the morning hours, between 9 and 10. Our lowest point is usually around 3 in the afternoon. Knowing when your alertness is at its peak and when it is at its lowest point is especially important for people who work in emergency services. One of the things that, that I would think firefighters could be aware of is just the basic circadian rhythms themselves, such as the, the oscillation in, in mental alertness. I mean, in the afternoon hours, all of us are programmed to have, have a dip in mental alertness, roughly from about 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, it's at that point that they, they would need to be probably more vigilant in terms of answering a call. Sort of like drivers out on the street should strive to be more vigilant around 3 o'clock in the afternoon because you see a peak in accidents because of this lowered mental alertness. So if they can work with their circadian rhythms, if they can have a greater awareness of what those basic circadian rhythms are that can, you know, interact with their work, I think that would be important. A typical day for Ray revolves around a normal daytime schedule. But because his job also requires him to be on call for emergencies, that schedule is usually disrupted. 
So I get here about seven. So between seven and eight, I'm either getting myself organized or getting information from my partner that's going off duty or, or the guy who's worked prior, prior to me. And he gives me a rundown of, of how their day went. And then from about eight to nine, we read memos. Um, we talk about what's going on within the station or what's going on within the organization. From about nine to 10, we do a station cleanup. And from 10 to 12, we either get ourselves organized and prepared to go train uh, or get prepared for fire prevention or some class or some kind of public education demo that we might be doing. And then sometime between 11 and, and 12, and we prepare lunch and eat lunch and try to, to take a nap 10 to 15 minutes sometimes. Sometimes we sleep a little bit longer, but 10 to 15 minutes is optimum. So sometime between 1.30 and 2, we'll uh, again get prepared and go out and continue on with the daily activities. Again, fire prevention, inspections, training, public education. Somewhere in there between our regular work day, which is 8 to 4, we'll obviously run calls, whatever they may be. And then from 4 to 6, we work out. 6 o'clock, we eat chow, we clean up play a little bit of basketball after, and then about 8 o'clock we start winding down and getting ready to hit the rack. And about 9 o'clock, 9.30, I'll be in bed and I'll read. I'll do some self-study or something. And about 10, 10.30, I'll turn my light out and and that's it. And maybe sleep all night, probably not. And then about 7 o'clock, get up and go home. What Ray has just described is a typical ideal workday that is synchronized with his body's own natural circadian rhythms. Doing paperwork and scheduling tasks such as classes and training during the morning hours between 8 a.m. and noon roughly falls into the time period when we are all most mentally alert. Ray also uses the time between 9 and 9.30 p.m. to study another peak alert time. According to the ebb and flow of circadian cycles, the peak degree of sleepiness usually occurs around 3 a.m. as well as 3 p.m. Because his job often disrupts his sleep patterns, Ray has found that an afternoon nap is essential. A lot of people will have a siesta time or a post-lunch lull in the early afternoon. That seems to be a lull in the circadian rhythm, so if someone were to lie down during that period of time, they would be more likely to fall asleep than they might in the mid-morning or in the late afternoon. People who work night shift or rotating shift hours are out of sync with their environmental clock and can suffer from physical and mental fatigue. I'm going to be very irritated if we get up again. I'm tired. I want to go to bed and sleep all night. Recently, there was a survey done by the National Sleep Foundation which indicated that the average American adult is only sleeping about six hours and 50 minutes a night, which is for most people too short. So what's going to happen is people are undergoing some level of partial sleep deprivation. I'll try on my days off to sleep, to eat right. No matter how hard I try, no, I never feel totally rested when I come back to work. I feel okay, you know, 100%, but, you know, there's still something that, you know, just because you're here, your body's always working just a little bit despite how hard you try to relax and you know, close your eyes, there's still part of it that's just always on, always on. Even at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, it's always on. <laughs>